Hello again, my dear students, and welcome back to the Informatics 2 class, and we're going to start lesson number 20, uh, 22. In this lesson, we're going to continue on the recursion. Remember last time we introduced the concept of recursion, and we have given some examples, basically the factorial and the Fibonacci. And we're going to see, formulate the problems a little bit more uh, systematically this time. So we're going to be uh, designing recursive algorithms and uh, talk about how to design them. And then we're going to talk about some implementation considerations. And then we're going to revisit the binary search. Remember the binary search, uh, w which we have developed a while ago? Uh, well, we're going to see that it could be implemented in sort of a recursion uh, way. And we're going to see how we're going to do that this time. And then we're going to introduce a very nice puzzle, a very well-known puzzle, which is called Eight Queens Puzzle. OK? Let's see how this is going to go. Designing recursive algorithms. Well, there are very basic steps that we have to follow when we design an algorithm in a recursive manner. The first thing is that we have to find the key step. And the key step is basically answers the question how the problem can, de can be divided into parts. Now I have a problem and I would like uh, to solve this problem of course and I cannot take it as one shot but rather I have to divide it into sub problems, sub tasks so that I can handle each of these sub tasks, solve these sub tasks together and then integrate my solution to get to the final solution of my problem. So it's very important in the analysis to start by dividing the big problem into smaller ones. <clears throat> And then, once we do that, we have to find the stopping rule. And the stopping rule, remember, this is the key step in designing a recursive algorithm. And uh, this, this is what we called the base case or the terminating condition. And basically, uh, we have to find this special case that's very basic and very trivial, basically. Uh, and that's easy to handle without recursion. And uh, that's going to be the first thing I'm going to check when I enter the program all the time. So I check, do I, uh, do I reach this point? If yes, then I will just perform a very simple calculation and return. And that's going to be the last time I'm going to call my function. Otherwise, I'm going to be in the middle of the process uh, handling my other subtasks or other steps in the procedure. After that, I need to outline the program. And this means I have to draw some sort of a, a, a flow chart, basically, or a block diagram or something like that, which, help, which helps me uh, uh, show the main steps I'm going to go through to uh, get to, the, uh, to my final solution. And this basically is going to combine the two key steps that uh, we have mentioned already. The first one is the terminating condition, which was number two on the previous slide, and the, what we call general case, which divides the big problem into smaller problems. And each time the bigger problem is going to be reduced one step downward till we get to the final case or the terminating condition. So the, in this step, we're going to combine these, uh, these previous two steps together uh, in one uh, sort of decision-making statement. And usually the main statement in any recursion uh, kind of function is actually a big if statement. If uh, terminating condition is reached, do this and that and return. Otherwise, make your problem a little bit smaller and then call the function again. All right. Usually, in a recursive function, we don't have any loops. We don't have a while statement or a for statement. Okay. The function iterates by, repeat, uh, by repeating the call statements again and again, each time with a smaller size of the general case. And uh, as a final step that we have to be aware of is to check the terminating condition. It's very important and it's very crucial, as a matter of fact, to make sure that I will always get to that terminating condition. Otherwise, if I'm not going to meet that condition at any time, that means I'm going to uh, keep calling the function again and again forever, and I'm going to get into um, a sort of an uh, infinite loop. And this is very dangerous. And that means I'm going to keep calling the functions. The stack is going to grow very fast, and it's going to become huge, and I will never basically return from this function. 
Okay, so I have to make sure that the terminating condition is, first of all, unique and that I'm going to reach it uh, uh, by going in the big pr uh, bigger problem in steps downward. Uh, the, uh, basically, uh, I have to have the size of the task uh, uh, shrinking down till I get to this terminating condition. So this has to be verified before I can launch my program. Of course, always it helps me to draw this recursion tree. This helps me graphically, at least, before I start writing my code and before I start running my code, is to draw this recursion tree, which shows me the, uh, the sequence of steps that I'm going to follow, actually, uh, in these consecutive uh, uh, call statements to the same function again and again to verify that when I start from main, okay, and then I start branching the, to these. Uh, to this uh, recursive function again and again is that the this route is gonna lead me back to the main again and uh, so that I can finish the whole task required uh, by the uh, program okay so this is a very helpful tool as a matter of fact when we analyze our algorithm before we physically implement it in, in, in terms of uh, a C program or any other language program All right, implementation considerations. What do I need to take care of when, it, when I uh, want to solve a problem? Whether I want to solve it using uh, the recursive technique or the uh, normal iterative technique? Well, there are so many things that I need to take into consideration uh, when it comes to that. Well, the first thing, the environment this my program is going to work on. Is it a single processor environment or a multiprocessor environment? Well, that makes a difference. Because basically if I have a parallel processing environment or a multiprocessor environment, then maybe if, uh, uh, if the problem, the nature of the problem that I have in hand uh, uh, allows me to perform several tasks at the same time, then I can divide the load between the different processors that I have in my environment. And in that case, I'm afraid I'm not going to be using the recursive technique because recursive means sequential one after the other call and then another call another call and so forth okay so by nature the problem of recursive uh, uh, of recursive nature is actually implemented on a single processor so to get benefit of the multiprocessing environment then i would rather use the iterative uh, uh, technique uh, uh, rather than the recursive technique. However, it depends actually upon the application and upon the situation. I could have some sort of parallelism inside the recursive function itself. So yes, I can build a recursive function uh, uh, and still I can use the recursive techniques on a multiprocessor environment. So this depends upon the application. But the basic idea is that if you have a multiprocessor environment, try to utilize the time of all the, of these processors in the environment. Second consideration. Reiterant programs. What are these? Reiterant programs are the kind of programs that I refer to them a lot. And I could use them many times back and forth. So if that is the case, then uh, I need to think uh, uh, carefully when I implement these kind of programs uh, uh, to be in a recursive or iterative matter. Data structures. The data structure is the most crucial and important, actually, unit in building and in designing your software or your program always. And that's the, actually the basic, the whole idea behind this, uh, this course, Informatics too. Uh, it's important to select the most proper uh, structure for your program. And this depends upon the application. Do I use a stack? Well, that depends upon the nature of interest that I have. If the nature of interest is kind of stack-like thing to where I would stack things on top of each other, pushes and pops, then I will use a stack. I might use queues if, if, I'm to, uh, if I will be talking about serving people in line. Or I could use just uh, uh, unrestricted general uh, linked lists or maybe trees, binary trees, although we did not uh, cover this topic, but at least it's a structure that's there. All right, so selecting the proper and the suitable uh, structure 
is a, uh, uh, is a key step actually in designing your code and in designing your program. And this makes a difference in terms of uh, uh, memory usage, in terms of computer time, uh, uh, as I want my program to, to run the fastest, as fast as possible at least, on the computer. So I have to think about this when I design or implement my solution. Okay. Let's take now the binary search as an application on the uh, recursion process. Uh, do we remember the binary search? Binary search is basically works on ordered lists, if you all remember. And uh, we use it with arrays, of course, and not with linked lists, because the nature of linked lists is of sequential uh, uh, access kind of, uh, kind of structure. And uh, if we have a list now, an array uh, kind of list, and I want to search for a certain target in that list. Well, the prerequisite, as we know, is that the array has to be ordered. And then, instead of uh, uh, searching uh, uh, at uh, one entry after the other, looking for my target, I would rather look at the item in the middle of the array, which we call mid. All right? And then I compare my target with this. Is it larger or smaller or even equal? If it's equal, that means, okay, I found my target and you just return. Well, all entries on the side basically, okay, are uh, actually less than the item I have at mid. So what I do, let's say I compared target with mid and I found that target is greater than mid. That means I'm going to ignore all entries in this half of the array and my entry, if it is to, uh, to be in the list, then it will be uh, somewhere in this upper half. Okay, so I ignore this lower half and then I will redefine my first to be pointing to mid plus one and then my last here and I calculate mid again and I redo the same process. Ha, huh. I redo the same process. That means uh, sort of recursive. I'm going to be doing the same thing again and again. However, uh, each time the limits for first and last are different. And that's exactly the idea. Each time in the process, the size of my list shrinks down to half. Okay, so that's the general case. You're going to be looking between first and last. Okay, and the size of this sub list it always shrinks down till I get to a point where first equals to last and that means I only have one entry left in my list and that could be my terminating condition, right? So the, 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 the nature of the binary search is sort of recursive then. And uh, let's look at this example and we have, uh, we have covered this ex exact example uh, when we talked about binary search uh, a while ago. So basically I have an array with 12 entries in here like this the entries are already ordered, all right? Uh, and I would like to look for the, uh, my target 12. So what do I do? First points to the first entry in the list. Last points to the last entry in the list. That's the initial condition, okay? And I calculate mid to be the middle index uh, along this array. So it's 11 plus zero, uh, plus zero divided by two and that's five. So I go here and then I compare, is target equal to this, larger than this, less than this, based on this I make my decision. So in this case, it is less than 21. So I'm going to ignore this whole thing and I'm going to focus on this half, okay? So I'm going to repeat myself again. It's like calling the same function again, but this time with first pointing here, last pointing here. All right, and then I do the same thing. Calculate mid basically and look at the entry in, uh, at mid. Compare it with my target. Well, my target is larger. That means, okay, forget this half, okay, and focus on this half and redo the same thing again. But this time, your first is pointing here, your last is pointing here, and you do the process again. Calculate mid, well, mid points here, Compare it with your target. Okay, target is larger. Okay, redefine your first and last. All right, and redo the whole process again. 
Well, at this point, la first equals to last, and I only have one entry in there, and it doesn't equal to my target. I'm done. So my terminating condition, actually, is when I have first equals to last. Then I stop. So there is a general case to where I have to calculate this mid and check the item in there to see if it equals to, to my target or not. Okay. However, uh, the, the general case actually shrinks in size along the way because I redefine first and last after each uh, step when I don't find target. And I go to the proper half of the sublist I have in hand. All right. And I have a terminating condition, and that terminating condition is when I have first equals to last. This means stop, right? So the, these are basically the, the, the uh, basic components, two components for a recursive algorithm. So why not implement then the binary search using rec uh, recursion rather than normal iterative technique? Okay. So then to conclude, the base or terminating condition that we have is when first equals to last. That's when I stop my program. That's when I return, actually, and no further calls to the same function. General case is to calculate mid, and each time to make, after uh, I make the check, of course, is to make either first equal to mid or mid plus one, of course, if I want to go to the upper half, or make last equals to mid if I want to look at the lower half. All right? So that way, the size of my sublist in the subsequent step is going to be shorter by one half. So I'm actually reducing the size of, uh, of the, uh, 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 the sublist. And that means uh, with time, these two pointers pointing to the beginning and the end of the sublist in hand are going to uh, uh, be pointing to the same thing. And that means they're equal. And that's going to be my terminating condition. So this reduces the sublist size into half each time I go through the process. Based on this, let's now implement the binary search using recursion. I'm going to call it rec binary for recursive. It's binary search rec recursive version. The precondition, the array list has been already created and sorted. And this is a prerequisite for the binary search anyway. And furthermore, first points to the first entry, and last points to the last entry in the list. That's the initial condition. The post condition, after I uh, uh, return fully from this function, I will return uh, an index to where target was found, if it is uh, uh, found in the list. Otherwise, I'm just going to return minus 1 to indicate that target is not, is not in the list. Okay, Very simple and very straightforward. Let's see how we're going to implement uh, this in uh, C code. All right, the name of the function is rec binary, and it's, uh, uh, it has a return value of type integer, and this refers to the index where target is found uh, in case of successful uh, uh, search. I'm passing uh, an, uh, an integer array, and this is just of type integers just for the heck of illustration. It could be anything. Okay. And uh, again, I'm passing the target, okay, which is of the same t uh, type as the entries in this list. And I would like to find where, uh, where target is located in the list. And of course, I'm passing the two indices, first and last, which are going to be used to point to the first and last entries in the sublist at any given stage in the process. All right, let's start. I'm going to initialize mid to be minus 1. And I'm using the value of minus 1. Actually, I'm going to return mid, as we're going to see. All right? So in case I don't find t uh, my target, I'm going to return minus 1. That's why I'm using this minus 1 as an, uh, as an initialization step. We're going to uh, uh, see this uh, more clearly uh, on the coming slide. What do I do after that? I start always by checking for my terminating condition with the big if statement, right? So this is the main statement. If 
first equals to last, less than or equal. Okay? If it is uh, equal to last, okay, so that means, or less, that means we're still having time to do things. Okay? Especially if it's less. Then what do I need to do? I will make mid equals to first plus last divided by two. Okay? Uh, and that means go to the middle of the sublist you have in hand. Still, I'm saying first is this than last. We'll talk about this equal in a, in, in a second. All right? So if first is still less than last, calculate middle. Okay. I have to draw a little thing in here just for the illustration. So here's first and here's last. First is the less than last here, so I, I would like to calculate mid, which is basically first plus l uh, last divided by two. And now, if target is this than the entry in here, that means uh, I'm gonna go look into the lower half looking for my target, okay? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna recall this recursive binary again, all right? But this time, since I'm looking into this lower half, um, I'm gonna be passing the same list, same target. First stays the same as first. However, last is no more this last, but rather this entry right before mid, okay? So this is my new last, and this means the size of my list is half the original size, all right? And I'm gonna return my value in mid, all right? So that's why I initialized this to minus one at the very beginning, all right? Otherwise, else if target is greater than this entry, that means my target could be located somewhere in, in here, in the upper half, actually. If that is the case, then okay, redo this thing again, call again, the recursive binary function, pass list, target, but this time first is no more this first, but rather it's the entry right after mid, right? So first is gonna be mid plus one, and last is the very last entry that I have in list, all right? And I just return mid. So basically, I'm returning mid the whole time. It's either um, uh, I will have last equals to first, and that's my terminating condition. In that case, mid is going to stay as minus one, so basically I did not find my target. Or I will be calling this function again and again, either on the, uh, on the lower half or on the upper half. So in either this case or that case, the size of the sublist has been reduced to half, the original size, and then I'm passing it again to the same function, uh, making the same kind of calculations, all right? So basically, it's just a, a one big if statement. I check for my terminating condition, and if I reach to, the, uh, to that terminating condition, then I'm not gonna call the function again, and I'm gonna terminate, and otherwise, um, I will call the function with a smaller size of list. And in here, I'm just repeating what we have developed a while ago, the iterative version of the binary search, to where I have while loop or a for loop in the middle because I have to do everything in, the, in one shot of the, uh, of the function. And that's, uh, that was it. It returns uh, 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 an integer value as a return value, referring to the index of where target is located, takes list, all right, and takes target, and of course it takes first and last. Well, first in here is gonna be zero at the beginning, and I don't have to have it to pass it in here because I'm gonna always enter this uh, uh, function just once. So I'm gonna always start from zero to the very last. So I just need to pass the, the size of the list rather than first and last the way we did in their case of version. Okay, and then I'm defining here my three local variables, first, mid, and last. And basically, first is going to equal to zero. I always start from this. Last equals to the size minus one, because we always start from zero. That's, that's C, if you all remember. And then I'm going to start my loop. 
Okay, and I'm saying here, repeating the same thing, while first is less than or equal to last, calculate mid, and then check if target is actually bigger than the, the, the item in the middle, or it's larger than the item in the middle. If it is less than, then advance your first to point to the, uh, to the entry right after middle, all right? Otherwise, if target is less, then your last is gonna be pointing here and you're gonna be looking, looking into this range of the, uh, of the list, all right? And otherwise, that means if it's not larger, not less than, that means it's equal, in that case, return mid, and that gives me basically the index of that entry in the list, okay? So upon successful within the while loop, if I manage to get to this return in this else close, and that's when target equals to the item pointed by, by mid, then target was found, and I will have some index returning back as a return value of this function. Otherwise, I will get here, and I will then return minus one because simply target was not found in the list. That's what we have developed already. Uh, uh, a while ago. However, as we can see, it's much shorter in terms of code, much more compact when it comes to the, uh, to the recursive version rather than this iterative version. And uh, we're gonna uh, uh, see on the coming slide the recursive tree for the case of n equals 10. How do I propagate through these consecutive calls in the process to get to my final uh, decision on whether target was found or not? So basically, I'm gonna, uh, this basically represents mid. So I'm gonna calculate mid and then check if uh, my target is in the lower half or in the upper half or if it's equal. If it's equal, then I'm gonna return. All right, I'm not drawing that. However, if it's less, then I will recalculate mid again and check again. Is it less? If yes, then I will re recalculate mid. All right, uh, if it's greater, then I'm gonna go in this direction and recalculate uh, 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 again uh, the mid and perform the comparison again. All right, till I get to this end leaves. These leaves means that I ended with a size of one for my sublist. So it's either equal in the middle, and in that case, it's a fruitful, successful, true return. Otherwise, it's false, meaning that I'm returning minus one. Okay, so upper half again of this sub half and so forth if it, if it was already greater than the item at middle five, and that's how it grows. So basically, what I have in here at each circle of these is that I uh, check whether the, uh, the target equals to this or not equal to this. If it's equal, that means, okay, just return the index to it and the index is actually mid, whatever I have in here. So that's my return value on green, okay? If it's not equal, then I need to make the check whether it's bigger or smaller and these are the arrows I'm showing along the tree in here. So the way it goes, I start from here, then either this way or that way, and each time I'm gonna propagate all over these things and return back. Anytime I see uh, uh, my target, I will just return with this green thing uh, showing the index of the target in the list. Otherwise, I will keep uh, uh, going downward, uh, calling this recursive uh, binary function again and again till I get to the leaves and that's when I return a false value. Okay, the other topic which I would like to introduce is the eight queens puzzle. We're gonna introduce the puzzle itself in here and build some basic structure to how to solve it using the recursive uh, uh, technique. What's the eight queens puzzle? Do you all know chess? If you ever played chess, okay, there is this, one of the, uh, of the uh, uh, things that we use is what's so-called the queen, okay? And the puzzle says uh, that I would like to place on a, uh, uh, a chess board eight queens so that none of them can take another, okay? If you know the rules for chess, actually a queen takes another queen or any other piece if that other piece 
is actually on the same row or on the same column or on the same diagonal, either this diagonal or this diagonal. So basically, if I have a chessboard like this, and let's say I have this queen in the middle of the chessboard, then any piece that goes anywhere on these locations along this column or anywhere on these uh, uh, cells along the row or this diagonal or this diagonal, then it's going to be simply taken by this queen. All right? These are the basic rules of chess. Now, I would like to place eight of these queens on this chessboard so that none of them can take any other. Is there a possible way of doing that? Well, definitely there is. Here are some possible configurations. Somebody somehow came up with the solution. This is the first queen. And no pieces along its row. No pieces along its column. No pieces along its diagonal or this other diagonal. Same for this one. Okay? So this is a possible solution for the problem. And this is another solution. Okay, again, this queen, for example, no other queens are on the same row or the same column or on the two main diagonals it belongs to. Okay, that's simply the, the, the problem. That's the puzzle. Okay, we can do it by hand on a chessboard with real pieces. Can we put this in a sort of an algorithm so that we can solve it on the computer? Sure we can, why not? Let's see how we're going to develop that. Solving the eight queens puzzle. How to solve it? Luck? Antonio is the luckiest person, so if he gets this, these eight pieces, he's going to get a solution in five minutes. Can I always depend on that? I'm not sure if I can really rely on that. Keep trying, trial and error kind of thing. Yeah, you could end up with a solution at the end of the day. However, you could keep trying for days and days and you don't end up with a solution. This is not a systematic way of solving a problem systematically on a computer. I cannot rely on luck or trial and error on computer because that's going to kill the computer time trying again and again. Yes, the computer by luck could find a solution after several uh, trial and error attempts, but I cannot generalize this and assume it as my way of handling the problem. There has to be a better way of solving the problem, a more systematic way so that I can guarantee, at least on average, the number of computations that it takes to solve the problem on the computer, if it comes to computer. If you're playing at home, oh yeah, take your time. Rely on your luck to solve it. Well, it has much of exhaustive computations. Well, it has if I just don't look thoroughly into the problem and formulate the problem and propose a systematic solution for it. If it's going to be all uh, uh, depending on luck and trial and error, then definitely you're going to have exhaustive number of, uh, of computations, definitely. Is this an analytic problem by any meaning? Well, let's think. If it is an, an analytic problem, then I can analyze it. And then, always, if the problem is analyzed, uh, will defined, and then will uh, uh, we'll analyze, then I can propose a well-organized solution for it. And in that case, I can at least give a hint on the number of uh, operations, at least on average, to get to a solution. So I would like the problem to be some sort of analytic problem that's much more attractive to me as a programmer. That way I can write a more realistic program to solve the problem. Okay, let's think about it. If the person attempting to solve the puzzle was lucky enough to place eight queens on the chessboard, then definitely this is a solution. What do you do after that? You just show the solution and you're proud of it. Well, if he was not lucky, 
then one or more of the queens must be removed. You already put a, uh, uh, let's say, one piece, and then a second piece, everything was all right, and then you made, you tried to put the third one, and then you realized, no, this is not a good place to put this. So you have to move that queen, or you might decide to move that queen and some other queen, all right? So if you don't get to the solution, then you might need to remove one or more of the queens that are already on the chessboard, okay, and place them elsewhere and continue searching for a process, for a solution. Okay, sounds like good. We're getting into uh, understanding analytically, at least, the problem. To start formulating a program, one needs to sketch the method in a sort of algorithm form or algorithmic form. Well, let's denote the number of queens on the board to be in. All right? Then initially, no queens on the board, that means n equals to zero. Right? What structure uh, uh, should we use and how to structure the main step in the process? That's what we would like to look at in the following few steps. Well, the key step, just as an outline, we're going to call this function add queen function, which basically adds one queen to the chessboard, okay? And it checks if the, the, the location you're adding the queen to is all right or not. So basically, for every unguarded position on the board, the unguarded means the places where you can have a new queen, actually. Once you have a queen in place, the all cells along the column, the row, and two main diagonals are guarded. Ma that means you cannot have any other queen in there. So basically, for every unguarded position, basically place a, a queen in one of these positions. Let's say position B. Okay? And then you have one extra queen on the chessboard. So you increment your counter by one. Okay, I know that this position is unguarded, so it's safe to put, at least for now, to put your uh, queen in there. So after you increment your counter, you check, is your counter already eight? That means you already have eight queens uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the chessboard, and that's basically a solution, right? So print the configuration, and you're done. Otherwise, if n is less than, uh, uh, is this than eight yet, then we have to call this function again and add a new a queen, right? So I'm calling this function itself again, and that's, that means we're using the recursive uh, uh, kind of uh, algorithm, okay? The, uh, the uh, recursion uh, principle, all right? And then I could need for that to remove the queen from position B, and in that case, uh, I will decrement my counter by one. All right, that's basically, uh, in concept, what the eight queens puzzle is. I'm going to stop in here for today, and we're going to restart this uh, process again, and we're going to uh, solve the problem to the end. Of course, you can refer to this material on the internet by going to the Nutuno website, click on the Midnet U project, and you're going to find lots of interesting stuff. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time with the eight queens puzzle. Bye-bye.